welcome to another episode of Ipsodixic. My name is Jess Myers and I'm a new host of this podcast. I'm a second year law student at Santa Clara University School of Law where I study internet law and technology policy. This is my very first episode ever, so be kind and bear with me. For this episode, I'm interviewing Daria Belivina, a third year law student at the University of New Hampshire Franklin Pierce School of Law, where she studies privacy law. As a privacy expert, Daria has worked for the International Association of Privacy Professionals, also known as the IAPP, and is currently an intern with the ACLU New Hampshire chapter. Before law school, Daria graduated from the University of Houston with a bachelor's degree in computer science. Thanks for joining us today, Daria. Hi, I'm stoked to be here. Awesome. So, Daria, I was hoping you could maybe start by telling us more about yourself and your rising privacy career. You know, what, why privacy law and where do you think your career is headed after law school? Sure. Um, so I started in uh, patent law, actually. I ended up going to UNH Franklin Pierce because I thought I wanted to do patent law. Um, that was, uh, <laughs> I ended up realizing that I didn't really like patent law. And so I was a 2L and I was looking for a new field that I would be interested in, but I still wanted to use my computer science background. Um, but then I ended up taking a privacy law class. I really liked it. Um, I took internet law. I took a bunch of other privacy law courses and that just sort of, um, it's sort of, I love the fact that privacy is very philosophical. I love, there's a lot of theory into it. I love that there's a lot of nuance. I love that there's not quite a clear definition of what privacy is. And I think that's what makes this feel really fascinating for me. Um, where I'm going from now is, I think <laughs> I currently have a job offer in Chicago um, at a big four accounting firm. So I'm probably gonna be doing some consulting from there and hopefully after that, um, We'll see. Awesome. I'm curious, are you still using your computer science degrees and in, in, a, in a way that you thought you were going to use it before? Um, not in the way that I thought I was going to use it before, because before I used to think I was going to do patents. So I was one of those really like type A kids in high school. And so I decided as a junior in high school that I was going to be a patent attorney. Um, and I'm not entirely sure why I made that decision. I just chose to do that. But now, um, I think that the way that I use my computer science background is I think I provide technical explanations to what a lot of people just sort of see as a black box. I think that people, whenever they see a computer and whenever they think about the types of data that is used on that computer and how it's transmitted, it is a big black box. You don't really know what's going in and you don't really know what's going out. And I think it's helpful to have the technical background because then you get to actually know like how, what your input is and how that's being processed. Excellent. Right. I, I definitely agree. Do you find yourself still coding? these days? Oh, God, no. I wish. I just don't have the time for it. I've been, I want to, I want to take advantage of this social distancing quarantine to take some classes. I think there's like free classes on plural site this month. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's like, what do I, what would I even code at this point? Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. I've been, I've, I've felt the same way. I think I've kind of, as a computer scientist myself, I think I've kind of fallen off the boat with, with coding, but I do see technology come up in many ways. So I've been wanting to, um, you know how Lexus has um, like free daily points that you can get? Yeah. I've been wanting to create like a little like script or a bot that just does free, that just does daily random searches so I can just get those like automatically, but I haven't really started on that yet. I don't even know if that would be ethical. <laughs> let, me know, let me know if you do that. Um, I, that's something I know I would be super interest, interested in as well. So that, that sounds like a cool, cool project. Um, so you worked for the IAPP and you're now working for ACLU. Can you talk a little bit about what you did and what you are doing for, for both? Absolutely. Absolutely. So when I was at the IPP, a lot of my work mostly revolved around the GDPR. So things that I did was like, I updated the GDPR Genius, which is a tool that the IPP has that maps different um, GDPR articles to stories. So I would find uh, GDPR related news and map them to the related GDPR article. Um, another thing that I did was I worked on uh, there's three articles that I worked on. So they re, they surrounded DPIAs, what is data protection impact assessments, which you need to do whenever you have a high risk um, 
data processing activity. Another thing that I worked on is DSARs, which are data subject access requests, which is a way that a data subject, i.e. a consumer, can access their data from a company. And the last thing that I worked on was, I don't even remember. <laughs> um, it was another article, um, oh gosh, if I remember what it was, it was DPIAs, DSARs, I have to look it up, I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, you're okay, that's what all right. I, I mean, it's kind of hard I, to hearken back to, you know, all of your previous internships and, and careers, and you, then, you know, you do so much in law school too, so that, I think that gives yeah, a pretty yeah. good explanation of, of what you did with the IAPP. Do you have any of the IAPP certifications? I do. I have the CIPP E and the CIPP US. So I have the European one and the US one. Excellent. Um, Would yeah. you recommend those certifications for, I guess, rising uh, privacy scholars? Absolutely. I mean, I think they're a little pricey, but I think they're pretty reasonable to study for. I don't think the material um, is necessarily difficult to un to grasp. I think it's a fair test, and I think it's very um, advantageous considering when I was searching for jobs, a lot of the privacy positions were either like CIPP US preferred or required. Uh, okay, so that's, I mean, that's interesting. That's something that people could be doing right now, I guess, if in their quarantine I, time, if they have it. Oh, for sure. Yeah, it's a, it, I highly recommend um, getting the certifications if it's possible for those who are interested in finding a job in privacy. Awesome. Do you think you'll be getting any others? I thought about getting the CIPM, um, the, which is the CIP but management and the CIPT, which is the technology. But uh, I don't know. My current job doesn't require those certifications, but the one that I am thinking about getting is not an IPP cert, but it's a CSSP, um, which is a computer security systems professional. Um, those, that's something that my job is interested in um, funding if I do get it. So, but I, I don't know, that, that's a very security uh, focused certification. Very cool. I mean, there's so many different things you can do in privacy and technology that I think is, I think that's pretty, that's pretty fascinating. And it's an awesome field for um, any student, any prospective law students, if you're thinking about it, you know, the privacy field is booming. So um, thanks for, for giving that background there. What are you, what are you up to at the ACLU? So I'm doing a lot of FOIA research, uh, Freedom of Information Act. Um, that's mostly, so this is a case that we've um, talked about publicly, but currently the city of Concord has a $5,100 line item in their budget from the police department. Um, where in, and, for, and the line item is for, quote, covert uh, surveillance equipment. And we're not, so we filed a right to know request, which is New Hampshire's um, Freedom of Information Act um, counterpart. So we filed a right to know request and they haven't given us anything. Um, they said that it's a law enforcement record and so that they shouldn't be able to um, disclose what this covert surveillance equipment is. And so so I'm working on a lot of like FOIA research right now, like studying FOIA law because in uh, New Hampshire, there's not a lot of right to know case law. So we, uh, New Hampshire often will use federal FOIA case law in order to um, make decisions. And it's a really fascinating field. Um, for one thing is that like covert surveillance equipment is a really uh, popular phenomenon in the United States. Like I think ring doorbell a couple like, this year actually um, got in trouble because they were having these secret um, contracts with local police departments. Right, right. Surveillance, yeah. Excellent, I mean, that's excellent work um, that you're doing. So, you know, with that, it, it kind of makes me wonder, you know, where would you say that you fall on the privacy spectrum when it comes to balancing our need for these kind of technologies. Like, I don't know if you could say there's a need to have a ring doorbell, but it's, it's definitely useful. Um, or, you know, technologies like Zoom, for instance, um, and, and the need to protect our privacy interests. Um, I think it's very unfortunate that sometimes that has to be a choice. And I think it's also unfortunate that we don't have a choice between our privacy and a technology that we use. Like, uh, for example, Zoom has had a lot of 
um, privacy issues that have come to the forefront. And to their credit, Zoom has responded to those privacy issues pretty promptly. But at the same time, it is unfortunate that if there is a problem with a uh, platform that ha with privacy issues that if you're a student and you're have to use those platforms that you don't really have a choice but I think overall I've always fallen into a skeptical category <laughs> despite what I just said um, and I think that's just because I don't really know what privacy is I think and I think anyone does I think it's really hard to define it like 100% whether something is private or not. And I think that's because privacy is very subjective. And as far as something is subjective, there's no universal um, doctrine or universal way to define it. And I think that's where I start to get interested in privacy. I love it when there's something that's like very hard to define and very hard to nail down and very hard to say like, hey, this exists for sure, even though it's super subjective and super hard to pin down. Right. When you say uh, you're skeptical, do you mean you're skeptical of the technology services or about the definition of privacy? Oh, I'm skeptical about the definition of privacy. I think there's definitely been a little bit of... Uh, there's been an, a zealous advocacy for privacy and I think that's very justified and I think but I think in some ways it's also been uh, responded with tech lash or responded to and been interpreted the wrong way so for example like people hate um, <laughs> like ads right but like ads run the internet you know we want to be able to use free services and free uh, platforms but we have to be able to be okay with the fact that these services are collecting data and creating you know behavior profiles and targeting profiles on us in order to um, you know target ads at us and that's that's like, that's a fair balance, I think, in my mind. But a lot of people are not okay with um, the fact that they're collecting data on them at all, even though they are using that free service. But at the same time, I understand why there's zealousness because we don't really know, again, it's a black box. We don't really know what's being collected and to what extent it is fair and it's a fair bargain to use this free service for the amount of data that they're collecting about us. Right. Yeah, I think you held a very healthy sort of perspective on, on you know, the line between our privacy interests and, you know, um, bolstering technology services and allowing them to do what they do um, so that we can use them, um, Thank you. which is interesting as I think I think you and I pretty much agree on that aspect. But, you know, a few days ago, we had an uh, uh, intriguing back and forth on Twitter that kind of brought us to this podcast episode today that I kind of wanted to dig into a little bit. So you and I were discussing the Zoom privacy controversy. So I was hoping, can you speak a little bit about some of these issues that Zoom is facing? Um, I know consumers are concerned about end-to-end -end encryption or Zoom's lack thereof, at least for their, their video component. Um, what, what are the concerns out there regarding Zoom? Sure. So one of the biggest concerns, I think, in the privacy perspective is that they're not being super transparent about their practices. So the class action lawsuit, I think, that we discussed was the one about sharing information with Facebook. So the problem with that was that Zoom was sharing inform uh, what it was called um, analytic information with Facebook, and this happened whether or not you had a Facebook account or not. So whenever you would open the Zoom app, it would send data to Facebook, and this was basic analytics data. So when, you know, how long your conference call was, who you were having a conference call with, uh, when you were having this conference call, et cetera. And the issue was that they didn't really tell people they were doing this. This was not clear in their privacy policy. They said generally that they could share information with third parties, but they didn't really specifically mention Facebook, although they did mention Google, which was weird. Um, so regardless if you had a Facebook account or not, your data got sent to uh, Facebook. Zoom now says, because uh, this was, everything's happening so fast, Zoom now says that they changed this practice, so uh, that's good. Um, but another issue that we've run into is, like you mentioned, the end-to-end -end encryption. Uh, the privacy issue surrounding that is that they don't really, they kind of advertise their service as having that kind of encryption when they actually don't. 
And so we're just having, what's popping up with Zoom is these issues with transparency. And I think since then, Zoom has also addressed that, but I'm not super sure. That's interesting. Um, you bring up the transparency point. So when you get to Zoom needing to be more transparent, what specifically are you, are you kind of talking about? So like what concrete ways could Zoom be more transparent with their consumers? It, could it be in, you know, how exactly they implement their security measures or just simply stating our video conferencing doesn't, isn't, isn't encrypted. The chat, I believe, is encrypted, um, but not the video portion. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of layers to that they could do. That's a really good question because another transparency issue is that if you're a host, right, you can do attention, you can track the attention of your host. You can try on a feature that tells you whether or not your guests are paying attention to what you're doing. And another thing that you can do is you can download private chats. So if you're a host and you have a a uh, large group meeting and those people in your groups are having private chats in between those can be read by the host and I think a lot of people were unaware of that <laughs> whenever they um, whenever all of this started and so I think for a couple of things that would be really helpful is one if the users who like had some sort of choice to either opt out of having their attention tracked or having or opting out of having their private messages be read by the host. And another thing is maybe update their privacy policy, like specifically say like, hey, we're sending data to Facebook <laughs> or just don't do it. Yeah, you know, I talking about that, the fact that the, the Zoom host can see private communications, I'm kind of on the, I, I'm conflicted with that one. So you know, the way I see it, there might be a good reason why the host should be able to probably view private communications and to be able to command attention as the host of the meeting. I, I almost see it as, you know, kind of a content moderation design issue. Um, the host should probably have control over their own meeting. But at the same time, I think you're right. You know, when we say that messages are private, I think Consumers are expecting that if I send a quote unquote private message to you, no one else should be able to read that. Um, yeah. I, I'm curious about, you know, your, your thoughts on, on that regard as well. No, I think you're right. Like, absolutely. That there's probably a really good reason as to why, let's say a teacher who has a Zoom class should be able to read what her students are sending in between uh, class, right? There's probably a really good reason. But at the same time, I think it's like I had a, um, when I was taking a Zoom class, um, a student was sending um, mean private messages um, asking about like what was going on in class. And I think that's fine. But I think at the same time, like, if the student was aware that the host could just read those messages, they may not have done that. And I think that's the issue is that a lot of people are unaware that that's a possibility. A lot of people are unaware that, that when they do send a private chat to another person in a Zoom meeting, that that could be read by somebody else when they specifically intended for it to be sent to just one person. Right. And I, I agree with you. I, I think that's, that's a messaging, that's a messaging and transparency problem that, that can be cleared up. Maybe, in, you know, you don't call it private messaging or private chat, for instance. Yeah. Um, or maybe even a disclosure of some sort that says, right. Hey, like you're sending this to this person, but um, it could be read. Absolutely. Well, thanks for uh, giving us kind of the rundown here um, about the Zoom concerns. I know this is super relevant, especially since everybody seems to be using Zoom. It's the, um, I guess, one of the more popular video conferencing services right now amidst the chaos that is this pandemic. Um, yeah. So on for Twitter, sure. you and I specifically, we, you alluded to it a little while ago, we were discussing that recent class action um, that was launched against Zoom for their unauthorized sharing of data with third party services like Facebook. So I, I had said on Twitter originally that the suit seemed op opportunistic in light of the current pandemic. You seem to have some different thoughts about that though. So I was wondering, you know, do you wanna get more, maybe discuss a little bit more about the suit and, and share some of your first impressions and insights? Sure, um, so I mean, from my understanding is that this Zoom, this, is this the same lawsuit that talks about the Facebook, right? Yeah. So like I said earlier, like they didn't, um, they sent, Facebook data to, uh, sorry, they sent data to Facebook, basic and a little data, and they didn't disclose it in their party. Um, I think that overall, what I think is that, I think this was a couple of days ago, and I think ever since then, Zoom has had several responses. Um, but 
I think this is kind of like par for the course at this point. Like I think Zoom used to be just used for conference calls, right? Like it used to just be like just businesses or whatever. Like it used to not be used at this level. People didn't just use, you know, have Zoom nights, hangouts every night and use it for class and also use it for business meetings and whatever. Like Zoom just used to be for uh, conference calls. And now that it's being used so much differently than it used to be used all of these different issues are popping up. And I think at one point, what Zoom was doing before all of this happened was probably either not heavily scrutinized or it was and no one really cared because it was just used at such a low frequency that no one really uh, bothered about it. But I think now that it's being used from everyone who just wants to like hang out on hang out with their friends to playing board games online to have a full business meeting to uh you know have a whole class hosted on zoom it's just being used at such a wide and ubiquitous way that we there's just so much more increased scrutiny and the standards for its domain have increased so can you get into a little bit about why you think those standards are, are different between when we were originally using Zoom sort of pre-pandemic for, for conference calls versus, you know, as you mentioned now, people using it for board games and virtual hangouts and, and happy hours and, and those sort of things. You know, what, what sort of standards change, change and, and why? Why do they need to change? That's a good question. I think for one, it's being used in different ways. I don't think when Zoom was created and pre-pandemic that they ever anticipated being used for classes like this, or maybe they did, but at least not almost at every university and by every person ever. Um, I think that, so for one, is that there, the way that Zoom is being used has changed. And because the way that Zoom is being used has changed, it's being used by different people as well and by a lot more people. So a lot more people and a lot more data is at stake. And I think that naturally leads to increased scrutiny. Whereas you have way more people who could be risking and feeding their data into the Zoom black box and that could be insecure. So it seems like the scope of the content has expanded with its Correct. use. That makes sense. Um, so, you know, one of the things that stood out to me about this, this suit in particular, and this is, again, this is the class action suit um, where Zoom is being accused of um, sharing, un unauthorized sharing of, of data to, in this case, Facebook. Um, but one of the things that kind of stood out to me in particular was that the personal information being complained about, you know, being shared really had nothing to do with Zoom video or, or chat data. So instead, the complaint kind of points to um, application bundle identifiers, application instance IDs, device carriers, um, iOS language, iOS time zone, CPU cores, etc. To me, this sounds like standard device information that an app that shares when it allows users to log in via services like Facebook or Google. So I'm curious, in your opinion, is, is that really something consumers need to be concerned about and, and why? I mean, probably not, right? If it's just those kinds of things that are collected incidentally and naturally by using a service, probably not. But I think the biggest concern is that, A, it wasn't really clear that all of these things were being uh, collected, but I think the most important thing was that the stuff like the unique ad identifier like that created that allowed zoom and other companies to target the user with advertisements so they weren't just using this data just to be able to deliver a service to the uh, zoomers um, they were using this data in order to be able to triangulate and better target people with ads and i think the fact that they weren't super transparent about that, I think that's where consumers might feel a little uh, dismayed. Right. So again, I ask, I ask the same question, you know, so to you personally, is this, is this more of a transparency issue or should Zoom even be sending this information to, to Facebook and other services in the first place? You know, one thing that did stand out to me was that they ha were sharing this information with Facebook, even if you didn't have a Facebook account. Mm hmm. Yeah. And that's interesting. Um, well, I, I mean, I can't speak for everyone whether or not like 
they should be doing this. They're probably like, again, like advertisement and surveillance is the business model of the internet, right? We wouldn't have an internet if it wasn't for this kinds of advertising. At the same time, parties couldn't consent to this. They couldn't consent to, especially for those who didn't have a Facebook account. Um, and so that's where I think it's a problem, you know? maybe some people would not have used Zoom if they knew that their data was being given to Facebook. There's so many people who, you know, straight up canceled their Facebook accounts because they, in, you know, in the recent years, because they didn't agree with the way that Facebook was handling privacy. And I think those people would be, who are using Zoom now are probably very pissed that Zoom is sending them their data to Facebook, even though they don't have an account anymore. Um, Zoom now, however, does say that they changed the practice, but I think that it's definitely a, might be even a consent issue. It was the fact that nobody knew that this was happening and the fact that they didn't really have a chance to opt out. Right. Um, and, and, you know, you're right on that. The complaint even kind of gets into this, this discussion that, you know, the plaintiffs, if they had known, if they had consented, then they probably wouldn't have even used Zoom. Um, you know, we see throughout the complaint, we see the, the phrase unauthorized disclosure used. And I think that's specifically hearkening back to um, the newly enacted California Consumer Privacy Act. Um, I'm curious, you know, what, what to you is an unauthorized disclosure? As we start to figure out, you know, how the CCPA applies and how these definitions um, kind of scope out, these are some of the things that privacy professionals are trying to, to talk about. You know, is it enough that when you go and log into Zoom for the first time and you see that you can log in with Facebook, it, it, is that enough of consent to tell users, hey, well, face, they're, they're using a Facebook uh, SDK here, so there's probably some info going, going to Facebook. You know, what, what is the unauthorized disclosure there? I mean, I would guess the, I mean, my CCP, I have to admit that I'm not very good on the CCPA, but I mean, my guess is that the best, the, the, you know, whenever you log on to Zoom through Facebook, you know, there's probably some information there that is needed in order to complete that transaction. However, whenever you start sending data to Facebook outside of that, that's when it probably crosses the line into unauthorized disclosure, because that's when you start, you know, collecting unique user identifiers in order to target ads to people. So for example, like, let's take the person who doesn't have a Facebook account, um, if they sign on with, you know, without a Facebook account and then they start sending information to Facebook, that's probably where it would draw the line in my eyes. But again, my CCPA knowledge isn't very, um, good. That's okay. It's, I would say no one's CCPA knowledge is very good. <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> so, yeah, I know, you know, so the CCPA they were talking about, and I believe this has been removed recently. They're talking about having an opt-in, a, a silly, like designed opt-in button. So, you know, uh, curious about your thoughts on what what might be the move here for Zoom if they're trying to let users know, hey, we send this list of device data to Facebook. Is that something that appears, you know, as part of the, the login screen? Or is that just, you know, also another enumerated list in the privacy policy that may or may not get read? I mean, I don't know if this is a good answer or not, but to me, I think considering how other businesses also do this, just putting it in the privacy policy, like explicitly, mm -hmm. I think that would be enough. But that's just for me, because I think I'm pretty, <laughs> I'm not as, I don't think I'm super zealous, but at the same time, I think this is what a lot of companies do. A lot of companies share information with each other, with third parties and sell it, and they don't get FTC fines because they're too small and they fly under the radar. So I, but I think just putting it in the privacy policy and being explicit about it and honest and upfront, I think that's pretty fair. Um, I think also maybe just not selling uh, data to Facebook when you don't have a Facebook account, that's probably a good way to just, but I think if most people have a Facebook account and they're using their Facebooks to sign in, and if you disclose that, hey, we're sh you know, sharing your data so Facebook can send you ads, that's probably fair game. I think, I mean, and that kind of depresses me, but <laughs> I think just a simple privacy policy change would probably, I, I think it would satisfy me at least. Someone else would probably disagree. Right. I mean, you raise a really good point in that pretty much this is what any service is. I mean, not just video conferencing, but really any service on the internet that's using this federated login, which is, you know, 
this whole idea of I, can, I don't have to create an account with Zoom, I can just use my Facebook or my Google account to sign in. This, this, is, this is a real problem. I imagine that all of these different um, you know, login SDKs uh, take in the same kind of data that Zoom is taking in. Um, and it's just that now everybody is using Zoom and now we're, we're put on, now we're all aware of it. So, you know, as you mentioned, this is, this, this seems like this is going to be an issue, you know, for any type of service that's doing the same exact thing. Yeah. And I mean, not to mention there's <laughs> services that are doing a lot worse, you know, there's cookies and there's Google analytics and there's trackers out there. There's a lot that, um, I, I think that there's a lot that could be worse with this and i think this is bad but i think it could be worse right i think you're i think you're on par with the rest of the um with the rest of the infosec community as well uh, in that regard um you know a lot of people are saying oh well zoom is malware and that's what's causing a lot of panic over the the video conferencing as well like new york uh new york city pulling zoom entirely from their public schools what are your thoughts on that oh i saw that um yeah i mean i guess that's pretty, I don't know. I, at the same time, I'm kind of like, yeah, go, good for them. You know, they're actually taking a stand. They're showing that, you know, Zoom's actions will have a consequence. At the same time, you know, I, I don't know. I think, I don't know if a lot of people are following suit and I think Zoom is addressing the issue in a timely manner, it appears. And they're, you know, they're answering to all their security concerns. They're answering all this privacy stuff. The Zoom CEO admitted that he made a mistake. Um, as of April 5th, like Zoom enabled like waiting rooms and passwords to be automatic in order to address Zoom bombing concerns. So I think, I, I think maybe New York acted a little bit fast, but at the same time, I am kind of, I'm kind of like, yeah, way to go. Like it's, you know, it's the power of the market, but yeah. Right. I think that's an interesting that's an interesting point as well. I'm I'm on the fence. Um, I'm one of the as you saw on Facebook. I, again, I, I I don't think this is as big of a deal as people are making it out to be, and I worry about removing a service that is kind of proven to be the best on the market for being able to handle large scale um, classrooms. Uh, pulling that and now requiring these schools to find other educational um, opportunities. I think one of the complaints is that they're trying to move over to a Microsoft product and it's been, you know, it's, it's known as quote unquote clunky. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's the thing is like their substitute is it's probably not, well, it, they might find a safer substitute. And if there is a safer substitute or a more secure and private substitute than zoom, that's as effective and as efficient and as cool. Um, then by all means, then that will probably win market demand. But I think at this point, like, I think if New York wants to uh, not use Zoom and if they find a safer alternative, then that's also their decision, I guess. Um, but I also think that Zoom has been very good at responding to all of this. I mean, every time I see a Zoom problem so far, I've seen, like, the next day the Zoom CEO talking about it. So I, I think they're handling this very well. And I think Zoom is here to stay. I don't think Zoom will be shut out by all of these concerns. I don't think privacy will, like privacy pros will stifle Zoom or any other technology um, as long as it's not, you know, outrageous. But I don't think Zoom is being outrageous. I think there are things that definitely need to be addressed in order for it to be used on such a wide scale use. And, but I think it's, doing good. I think it's reacting properly to the privacy pros who are demanding more transparency. Right. Um, I think, you know, that's kind of the beauty of the marketplace too, and the, the beauty of the internet. So, um, you know, shifting gears a little bit, since we're both law students, I kind of wanted to get into the legal analysis a little bit that I, I had started on Twitter. So, you know, I'm, I'm kind of curious about standing. As you might recall from the Patel versus Facebook case, there was kind of an overarching concern that that suit, which involved, you know, Illinois' biometric privacy law, um, it, it would clear a path for plaintiffs to bring statutory privacy claims in, in all federal courts. So, you know, as, as you know, obviously, or 3L, um, Article 3 standing would require some sort of concrete injury beyond just a statutory violation. And, and there's kind of a circuit split when it comes to the extent at which plaintiffs must show harm to bring privacy and data breach causes of action. So, you know, in, in the Patel case, 
the Ninth Circuit actually affirmed their standing, saying that, you know, even though there was no concrete privacy harms alleged, um, there was, there's still this harm to the plaintiff's substantive privacy interests. So I'm curious if we're seeing the same thing here with Zoom, I, I couldn't pick out anything in the complaint that was really a concrete harm necessarily. So maybe, you know, is it enough that we're talking about substantive privacy interests it, it, or, or should we be more detailed um, in, in what we mean when we're talking about concrete privacy harms? So I'm not um, super, <laughs> uh, I don't know if I can speak on standing, but what I can say is that I think that's a really good question for like all privacy suits, um, especially data privacy and data protection in general. I think it's really, especially like for example, the Equifax breach, right? Um, the Equifax breach was a huge privacy viol was a huge privacy bomb, right? Because we had over like 2 million people who were had their data exposed and that opened them up to uh, identity theft right but we don't know when the identity theft could happen it could have happened already or it could happen 20 years from the future um and i think that's something that's very um very hard to show substantive injury especially in privacy because it's not like you know like if your identity gets stolen then maybe but like if you're, if someone steals your social security number because you were storing it on this website and the website was super insecure and then someone stole and someone, you know, hackers for sure stole your SSN, then like what, at what point does that, you know, even if they haven't stolen your identity yet, I would argue that there's a harm, but I don't know how, um, in general, I don't know if I'm like the one to speak on the Patel case because I'm not super well versed in it, I have to admit. I, right. I think you, so I think you brought up a, a, an interesting point there is, you know, privacy is kind of a new bear when it comes to these harms. It seems like, you know, it may not be super direct as in like, I punch you and okay, now we've got a slew of torts, but one breach can lead to a chain of results that result, that eventually is, it ends in some kind of harm to the consumer. Do you see that kind of being the case here with Zoom and sharing the data that they are sharing with Facebook? Um, no, because I don't, I think the data that they're sharing with Facebook is pretty non um, risky. It just, you know, it's unique user IDs and device IDs and stuff like that. I don't think you know, you have the same risk as having your identity stolen, but it does seem like there is some sort of privacy um, idea, I guess, or a privacy theory that is being violated because they're, they're the people who are trusting this service to, you know, um, to do what their privacy policy says is in turn not doing that. And because of that, it's sharing information about these users that these users were unaware is being shared about them and used in a certain way. So in that regard, do you still think that a suit is worthy here or is this something that again you know the market should kind of take care of on its own i think this is the market speaking i think the suit is the market speaking i think that the fact that this is a class action i think the fact that this is in a time when zoom has increased scrutiny i think the fact that they zoom is <laughs> admittedly in the wrong for opening up um, their data to facebook like that without telling the users and the fact that they were misleading about the privacy and the security standards that they have, I think that is whether or not it's a big, big harm and whether or not it leads to identity theft or any other tangential harm. I don't think that matters. I think the matters that keep just having a lawsuit that will keep Zoom accountable and answerable for these harms and for the practices, considering how important Zoom is in the current uh, market is what... Um, is what the market demands. I think people want more transparency. They want more privacy. And I think they're doing the right thing. You know, the, the complaint also mentions um, an unjust enrichment cause of action as well. Um, this is kind of the idea that Zoom is unfairly profiting off of our data, you know, on top of any of the alleged harms that, that privacy harms that might be out there. Um, but they're profiting off our data by serving it to Facebook. To me personally, at the same time, isn't isn't Zoom a free enterprise quality product? 
curious about your thoughts on on that cause of action. That's a good. That's a um, that's a good point. I think yeah, they are selling data to Facebook, and in return, they're able to um, deliver this platform to us. But at the same time, I think it just goes back to being transparent. I think if they just told people that hey, by using this, you're, uh, we are transferring this to third party, which includes Facebook, and we need to do that in order to have money, then I think that probably would have been a bit more fair. Right. So again, it's more of a transparency issue that you're seeing. Yeah, I think, and I think that's where the privacy harm comes in. I think a lot of these websites and platforms and tech worlds, they're, everyone's doing this. Everyone's is sharing data with third parties. But as far as, uh, so I don't think the actual sharing with third parties is the issue as long as they're not sharing something like, I don't know, like my SSN um, without my permission. But at this, this, I think the issue is that they're not disclosing and they're not being open about it. And that way consumers can't really know in whether they should choose Zoom if like, let's say I'm someone who really hates Facebook. Right, right. That's a very fair point. Um, so kind of shifting gears a little bit and kind of, we have a few more minutes. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Zoom bombing. Uh, that's sure. another kind of crazy topic right now uh, in today's world of internet law and, and policy, I guess. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit about what Zoom bombing is and, you know, <laughs> your concerns there? Yeah, so that one's really fun. Um, so basically the way that the Zoom uh, feature was, the way that you can call into a Zoom call, the way that it works, and this is before April 5th, before Zoom um, activated a bunch of different security protocols, the, you could basically brute force your way into a Zoom call that was unprotected by a password and you could share your screen and what people were doing, and I think these were mostly like 12 year old kids, is that they were, they were brute forcing their way into a meeting ID and they were sharing their screens and they would share like, I don't know, like dick pics or neo-Nazi propaganda or I think the most po common one was that video, um, two girls, one cup. But um, so they would in so classrooms, people's, you know, hangouts would get uh, suddenly interrupted by, you know, a giant image of explicit material. Um, that's been mostly so uh, again on April 5th, Zoom answered to this by implementing mandatory passwords. They recommend that if you had scheduled meetings before April 5th, that you reschedule them so that you can now have a password. Um, that's <laughs> it's a it's 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 I think that's pretty par for the course for the internet though I think if there's anything that's on the internet the internet will find a way to exploit it <laughs> right I absolutely and I, I think we've seen it's interesting everyone's kind of talking about how well this is super unique but we've seen this idea of zoom bombing before on the internet I mean even you know back in the 90s people would jump into private or public chat rooms and and put horrible content um, in there, or you would see people brigading different subreddits right now where you, you know, you go from some awful subreddit, that community jumps into maybe a, a subreddit about cats or something and <laughs> sends awful information. So it, was, it, it seems like this isn't, this isn't a new problem. It's, it's just something that's kind of new to the video conferencing world. For sure. And like I said before, like Zoom is being used in ways that it's not being used uh, before. And that's creating new problems, you know, like, for example, now people are like, oh, I can Zoom bomb people, I can, you know, do shenanigans on the internet using Zoom now as opposed to whatever I did before. So that's what I'm going to do. That's just the beauty of the internet. Right. Or, or yeah, you know, beauty or, I guess, <laughs> concerns. But yeah, I, I agree. Um, so kind of a final thought here. Who's, who's at fault when it comes to Zoom bombing? Is it is it Zoom? Is it the bad actors? Is it, you know, both? Who, who's the, who's that? I mean, that's, that's an amazing question. Um, that's, I mean, for sure, the people who Zoom bomb, the Zoom bombers have some sort of accountability, right? They are the ones who actually did bad things and exploited these things. But then there's also, I think there's also some responsibility to Zoom where if they know there's a problem and they did this, um, they should answer to it. So for example, like they started putting passwords in all their meetings, right, to respond to the Zoom bombing incident. So I think in a way, just by doing that, they admit that they do have some responsibility in preventing that. But I think in most, in, um, 
in general, I think most platforms have a responsibility to be secure and to deliver a good service in a good way to their consumers. And when, you know, other people can jump in and disrupt your use of that service pretty easily, I think that creates a problem with the service for not being secure enough. Um, one case that I love talking about, um, this wasn't a case case, but it was a security issue that the Asus N66U router had back in like 2013. Um, it was, uh, they had basically, um, it allowed anonymous access to files from basically anyone on the internet through an FTP protocol. So that, ba that basically means that anyone on the internet could go onto your router and access your files and they didn't even need like, to have a login or any kind of special permission. And the issue with that was that ASUS advertised this feature as a feature. They said that this wasn't a security bug, they said it was a feature because they wanted to have people share as much as possible with their friends on the internet. And that's obviously bad because like, and what happened was hashtag ASUSgate, where a bunch of hackers who we still don't know who they are, they went around on a bunch of machines and they left text files. So they went to everyone who had this router and they left a text file setting, saying, warning, you are vulnerable. And they told people like, hey, you have this bug on your machine. ASUS is doing nothing about it. Please turn off this feature in order to not be insecure. Um, and so that led to an FTC complaint and they later settled. But yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, if there's definitely some sort of accountability that platforms have in order to um, answer for, protect their, yeah, protect their platforms from bad actors. I think that's a great answer. And that's a super interesting um, case you kind of brought in there as well with regard to, to ASUS. It sounds like, you know, I mean, we could spend another podcast <laughs> even, you know, deep diving the CFAA. Uh, for sure, for that sure. Might, that might be brought to in, in that regard. Um, but I'll, I'll spare you for this conversation. <laughs> we'll, we can, that, could be another, that could be another discussion. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, so kind of to close this out here, I thought you, I thought you were, you gave some excellent perspective. Any final thoughts about Zoom? Are, are we blowing this out of proportion? You know, you know, what, what's, what's the next move? What should consumers be thinking about, you know, final um, thoughts on Zoom, I guess. <laughs> this has been a great time. Thank you for having me. I just want to say, I think, I'm actually really excited for Zoom. I think what th this is a new future It's a brave new world and zoom is going to be a part of our lives for a really long time and i think they're answering pretty good i mean it has issues but like what platform doesn't have its issues and i'm super excited to see how our relationships on the internet start to foster um and i want to and i'm excited to see like how and i think Part of the reason that Zoom responded so quickly to their complaints is because of the scrutiny that they've received from the public and the pressure that they've received from privacy professionals to want to keep Zoom accountable. Because I think if Zoom continued as they did, you know, as of several days ago, um, they would still be pretty insecure. And so I think it's good that companies are answering for their privacy issues when in a time when we're all on the internet and we're all using the internet at the same time and it's it's going to be a lot of fun i think i don't think this is the end of the conversation awesome well thank you so much daria you you gave us some excellent perspective um you are clearly a privacy expert and <laughs> i i look forward to having more conversations with you and you know anyone else that's super interested in talking about this topic as well um, thank you again for sharing your time and thank you to the listeners for listening to this first episode of mine as well. So yeah, um, with that, super fun, you know, Jess. thank you so much. Absolutely. All right. Well, I guess we'll uh, go ahead and end it there. Thank you so much. Have a good day. people who try to mind everybody's business with their own till they get into your hair? I mean the nosy kind. They stick to you like flannel underwear. They ask you a lot of questions. They want to know what it's all about. 
And when you see them coming near you, you want to scream, you want to shout. Well, I solved that problem. I know how to make them breathe. Just you tell them to mind their own darn business, and you go ahead and do as you darn please. For instance, girl, when you meet a man that's kind, and in return, you want to be kind, you find. Tell the whole world in front, even if it hurts them behind, that's your private affair. Now, some nice gentleman wants to pay your rent. In these times, ladies, that's a grand compliment. And he says, darling, do we? And you give your consent. Again, that's your private affair. Now, that old man Confucius said, girls give love or sell it. So why not cash in on what you got and be right here to tell it? Man, I find in her mir geschrieben. A sweetheart gehabt, dass sie schon sieben. Dass der Sache weggegeben ist, ist aber plenty geblieben. I mean her private affair. Gentlemen, I have a word for you. I know you're adventurous through and through. You got your eye on a gal and you make her good luck to you. That's your private affair. Now, some men at 50 reach their peak. They see they like to go out, have a little sneak. When it's over, then it's up to us, so tired and weak. I mean, with their private affairs. But when you meet an actress, why not become the actor? Insist on playing the leading part if you want it for a benefactor. You will that say, Mabel? Here's what you do. Du kannst dir nicht alles, darling, alles, was dich vermog. Im Batul für ihren Leib da hasrischen Tug. With your private affairs. You know, I know a lot of men that are mighty fine. And even when they didn't possess a dime. Did that stop me from saying, come up and see me sometime? Uh-uh. That was my private affair. And men who say they don't like women, that's Tommy Rot. They mustn't have what it takes, so they'd like them a lot. Because when a guy's blessed to see conceited and wants to give all he's got, I mean his private affair. They say that I've been married a lot of times, but I haven't got a family to show it. Well, when a gardener plants his flowers, does he guarantee that he'll grow it? I'm going to admit, I like them young. What's that? For that remark, I should be hung. Well, a young girl wants to fling. Will your man assume it's gemacht von Russian kids? I do want to get flung, and that's my private affair, and I love it, that's my private affair.